Okay, everyone, welcome. Good afternoon. So today uh, we have one of our PhD students dissertation seminar, uh, defense. So uh, it's going to be on the topic Wi-Fi sensing at the edge. He will give you more information, of course, but ask him tough questions. Right? We will have the committee discussion after that. So we will take you out after that meeting, uh, after the first session. But we will take your questions first. Uh, so here is the stage. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, everyone should be able to hear me. So this topic is gonna to be my PhD work over the past five years or so. Um, and it's, it's trying to figure out how we can achieve Wi-Fi sensing at the edge and how we can make scalable on-device machine learning and signal processing things for small uh, edge device, embeddable devices such as this. Um, so in this work, we've got three different categories of topics that I'd like to, to split all of the work into. The first one is the core thing that I mainly focus on, which is Wi-Fi sensing. So the question is, can we leverage the wireless signals that are already all around us from your phones and your laptops and the routers? Can we leverage that as a new sensor modality? So whether you have sensors, like wearable sensors on your body at any time, uh, these reflections from the wireless radio frequency, um, they could be used uh, like, like radar, essentially. Uh, the next step is tiny machine learning. So can we take large machine learning models and shrink them down to smaller sizes so that we can run them on small embedded devices just like this? Uh, and then moving on from that, not only just performing predictions with these machine learning models, but also can we then train more on these models and allow them to learn more information or personalize the models for, uh, for edge learning. So the goal of all of the work that I've done is kind of moving towards combining these three, three areas. Typically they're not really combined or at least Wi-Fi sensing so far hasn't really considered how you can run these things, on, um, run the sensor modality on the edge. So let's go ahead and start out with some background on what Wi-Fi sensing is and how we can achieve it. Uh, so here we've got two, uh, two microcontrollers. They have Wi-Fi on board. We've got a transmitter and we have a receiver. And when we send a packet over, um, over the radio, we, the, the signal or the, the packet or frame travels over a signal path. And we can quantify the signal path using something called channel state information. Now, if there's an object or a person in the environment, well, because the radios are not communicating in just one line of sight, they're also communicating omnidirectionally. Um, that signal is also going to reflect off of that person and reflect back to the, re the receiver device. So the question is, or the goal of Wi-Fi sensing is to try to leverage this multiple paths through channel state information to understand what the person is doing over time. So channel state information, uh, what that is is, what we have is the idea of subcarrier frequencies. So in Wi-Fi, we might have a baseband frequency uh, at 2.4 gigahertz. Well, if you use something called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, you can divide this frequency into smaller subfrequencies, and then we can transmit multiple multiple symbols uh, in parallel. Um, and if we look at it from a frequency from a frequency view, we can see uh, we have a center frequency and then each of these peaks is the different subcarrier frequencies. And for each of these, uh, whether they're data or pilots, subcarriers, uh, we channel state information gives us an amplitude and a phase. Um, and if we visualize this, we can see over time, each of these lines indicates that different, uh, the different results of channel state information. We can see that each of the subcarriers, even though they're at the same time, they reveal some different amount of information. So it's important that we have multiple subcarriers rather than one, because we might be able to understand more than a simple metric. So the reason that each of these has a different amplitude or phase is because we have to think about the multipath uh, environment. So as each of the paths go from transmitter to receiver, we end up with either constructive or destructive noise in the signal. And we have two different sets of paths of the multipath. So first we have a static path. So if we have a transmitter and then a receiver, well, if it reflects off of the ceiling down to the receiver, well, unless somebody's flying overhead, they're not going to change that path over time. So that's a static path. 
And then more interestingly is the dynamic path. So as I move, as I lecture, and as I make different gestures here, it's varying the paths. So that's the dynamic paths. Uh, so we did a big review of, there's a lot of papers that do Wi-Fi sensing. We did a big review, over 600 papers to identify different applications that people have used for Wi-Fi. We're not gonna talk about what other people are doing. That's not what we should be doing here. Uh, you can look at this paper if you're interested. Instead, we're gonna talk about the applications that we looked at in our lab uh, during my PhD. So first we wanted to see, can Wi-Fi sensing be used for small scale? Uh, so can we track hand movements, um, finger movements? Can we track uh, at a medium scale, full body movements, and even a larger scale, so a full, uh, full house or apartment environment? Can we track localized activities throughout that environment? We also looked at mobile tracking applications. So here we have a transmitter that's affixed static in the environment. And we have a person that's placed at the bottom left. And what we do is because my goal is to run uh, Wi-Fi sensing on small devices, embeddable devices, something that's standalone, well, we can, as long as we have a battery attached to this, we can easily walk around and capture channel state information. So here, the RX is me holding one of these devices and walking around and collecting data. And we end up with something like this. So we can filter out in the subcarrier uh, the movement of myself to detect that there was a person in the bottom left quadrant um, in this plot. And of course, we want to try to run all this data processing and denoising on, on the board. That's kind of the goal of this presentation. We've also looked at physical therapy rehabilitation. So um, again, looking at hand gestures, exercises to allow them. Uh, if someone has a stroke, it's good to perform repetitive exercises to try to help them out there. Uh, we've looked at fingers, limb movements, um, and the use of exercise equipment. And the key thing that I want to kind of mention here is that uh, the reason Wi-Fi sensing is so powerful or useful for physical therapy, let's say, is that if you have a stroke or something like this, um, it's really important within the first few days to start doing those exercises to regain the ability uh, that you might have lost. So, of course, having someone go in uh, constantly to a clinic might be really challenging depending on how many people we have to um, administer or track what they're doing. So, Let's say they do go to the clinic some of the times, but we also want them to perform exercises when they get home. So Wi-Fi sensing just makes it a little bit easier so they don't have to have wearable devices or anything uh, on their body to track these sorts of things. Uh, we also looked at soil sensing. So can we look at the permittivity of the soil um, using radio frequencies to understand things like moisture level? Um, and since we're using a network-based system, uh, we can build a big mesh of these sorts of devices. So in between each connection, we should be able to track something like, like moisture. And we tried this, um, we tried some laboratory experiments as well as some real world experiments. All right, so in summary, for the background of Wi-Fi sensing, I wanna mention these two things. So channel state information can be used to quantify the multipath environment. And that multipath environment then allows us to recognize the physical activities or physical attributes of that environment. Right. So now that we talked about the background of Wi-Fi sensing, let's see how we can start combining Wi-Fi sensing with edge computation, so running on small devices. So typically when people use channel state information or they do Wi-Fi sensing, they'll use one of these sorts of modules, whether that's a network interface card where you need a full computer to do all the processing and actually accomplish everything you need, or something like this USRP, which is a software-defined radio. Uh, these are expensive, they're laboratory equipment, they're not something that's going to actually be deployed, actually be used at a large scale. Uh, instead, what we did is we built this ESP32 CSI tool toolkit, um, and this is an open source project, it's on GitHub. It allows us to perform edge Wi-Fi sensing on these small devices. Um, they're low cost. So this module might be $20. You can go down to maybe $5 or less just for the, the Wi-Fi sensing uh, portion of it. Uh, we have 150 stars or over 150 stars on this project and over 50 forks in the past few years that we, we released it. Um, so we also had over uh, researchers from over 29 countries um, using this tool. So that's cool. That's pretty exciting to me at least. All right. So when we think of Wi-Fi sensing, there's two scenarios that we need to think about. 
So we've already talked about an active scenario. So a transmitter and receiver are communicating. They know of each other. They're sending data packets and acknowledgements back. They know of each other, so it's active. They respond to each other. We also have passive cases. So we can have a one of these devices that doesn't transmit any information, but it constantly receives this signal data because it's all transmitted omnidirectionally. The channel state information part of this is not encrypted in any way. Uh, so this means that this is a potential for surveillance attacks. But we'll get to that later on. But considering those two active and passive cases, we evaluated based on our sensor that we've been using, um, how much data can we actually capture from these devices? So for example, on the x-axis here, um, on the x-axis here, can we see this? Yes. Um, we have the transmission rate. So the transmission, uh, the, the transmitter sends out frames at some rate, some number of samples per second. And our expectation is that the receiver can then receive that same number of samples um, at the same rate. We do see that in the blue line, that's the active case. We basically achieve that one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, there are two cases where uh, the rate goes down a little bit, and that's just due to some integer math related to how quickly we can transmit over time. It's something we could uh, fix if we really needed it to be fixed. More interestingly though, we have the passive case. So in this case, only 75% of the transmitted uh, frames are actually captured by the device. So we think this is because of lack of retransmission. So if it's a passive case, you cannot ask to retransmit if there's any symbol errors. So for example, if the cyclic redundancy check fails, well, that means that whole frame gets ignored. We can't pass it on because we can't believe the information that might be in there. There's too much noise present. Uh, there's other engineering efforts um, that we can talk about, or we won't talk about the engineering efforts, but uh, we do have to be cautious about serial baud rate for these devices. The actual communication of this data is a bit slow, but we're not going to talk about that here. Instead, what we're going to look at is comparing what we can achieve here to what is achieved in other research works. So we found 176 papers, studies, that discuss what CSI sampling rate they used for their own Wi-Fi sensing tasks. And we found that about 50% of them use 100 hertz or less. So they don't use too many, or they don't require too many packets or frames to be captured per second. So um, we should be good there. Now, depending on what application we're trying to track, we can use something like the Nyquist-Shannon um, theory to, to choose that, but really it depends on what, what sort of actions or activities we're trying to sense. Now, in the survey work that we worked on, we built out this whole edge Wi-Fi sensing taxonomy. So the idea is, what sort of components do we need to have if we want to have a real world sensing system? So we start out with things like the theory, um, the theory of OFDM and CSI, um, as well as how do we apply signal processing to clean out the data? How do we prepare the data to then go into prediction making or machine learning? So those are the common things that you would see in Wi-Fi sensing. There's definitely some special parts that you need to think about uh, when you're using edge devices. But in general, those are very common. But more importantly, if we want an edge-based system, we do need to have uh, consideration of things like systems and hardware. So for example, if we have a network of these devices now, do we need to synchronize their clocks? How do we achieve that? Um, since it's a network, again, we need to have device-to-device -device communication considerations. So if some of the devices are in sleep mode over certain times to retain battery? Um, how do we make sure that they're able to get out of sleep mode to then interact with their pair, um, their transmitting or receiving pair? Um, and outside of that, there's also evaluation. So everyone considers things like accuracy and error for these systems, that's obvious. But we also have to consider sampling rate, like we talked about previously. What about the prediction rate? How quickly can we make predictions? Um, and since these are embedded devices and potentially mobile devices, how much energy cons is consumed by these devices? Uh, the one that I want to discuss here is about edge inference. So how quickly can we achieve, how quickly can we make predictions with our model? How many predictions can we make per second? Um, so the problem is with all of the papers that we've studied, we've only found 11 of them that actually discuss what sampling rate they were able to achieve. How quickly can they make a prediction? And this is the results of, of that. Um, on the x-axis, we have the inference rate. And we find that 
more than 50% of these works achieve a data rate of 10 hertz or less. And the thing that's important to understand here is that because we're introducing the idea of, oops, because we're introducing the idea of edge Wi-Fi sensing, Wi-Fi sensing on small devices, well, nobody else is using that. So they're using really powerful hardware, maybe multi-GPU setups or really powerful CPU systems. Um, so if you try to translate these state-of-the-art deep learning models onto an edge device, it takes way too long to, to make predictions and the energy usage is gonna be very high. Now, it's not, well, when we have a really high inference rate, what that means is we can get more real-time results. So as soon as something happens in the, uh, in the environment, we can make a prediction, we can, we can take action on this. Yes. Just a quick question to clarify. So why can't we use like common Wi-Fi access points or cell phones or something like this for this purpose? Yeah, absolutely, we could. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, we're looking at our own devices, but those can, again, it's a, it can be a passive system. So we can listen to those frames. And if we then change the firmware on those sorts of devices, we could capture CSI. So I mentioned uh, OFDM. That's something that's been standard for a long time in all Wi-Fi systems. So absolutely. It really- So why have a special device for them? Um, well, these sorts of devices, maybe not this one exactly, but, but this style of device is really common in um, a lot of the things, like the Internet of Things, right? So this is already existing. Okay. Yeah, so that's kind of the main idea. Thank you. Um, so we can achieve more real-time predictions, um, but also the faster we can make inferences, that means we can... Okay, so in this case, we were able to capture 10, or we're able to make predictions 10 times per second. If we only need 10 times per second, well, that means we're performing computations 100% of the time. We instead were able to achieve a faster inference rate, then we can reduce the amount of time that we're running computations, and we could potentially put the module into a sleep mode and save that energy. So what sort of things affect that inference rate? We have on the module, we might have to clock frequency or signal processing techniques that we have to be considerate about. Um, and over the past year, we have two works that discuss things like model compression. How do we make the model smaller so that there's less computation to do um, through either weight reuse or quantization. Um, so quantization is one of the more important things here. And we did look at how we can achieve different models on these devices um, using this. So here we have a sine wave. Um, Quantization, the, the goal is to reduce how many bits we need to use to encode any sort of thing. So we might need a lot of bits to encode this really clean curve here. So if we use instead three bits, we end up with eight buckets. We can end up, end up with a, the red line here. So it's, it's very jagged, but we do end up with the likeness of the sine wave here. So this quantization idea can be applied to any sort of things, images or the weights in the model and all sorts of things. So we did try this. Uh, so using uh, one model, we tried without quantization and with integer eight quantization. We can go to smaller uh, integer four and so on, but uh, that's beyond what we want to talk about here. Um, but we, we set up these models and we ran them on these small devices. And what we found is that there's actually four key ones that we want to look at. So we found that without quantization, these models are not able, go, able to fit or be compiled to run on this device. But if we do use integer eight quantization, we make the model small enough that we can now fit it on the, on the model or on the device. Uh, more importantly though, is the, the rate that we can make predictions. So without quantization here on the top, we achieved 145 Hertz. Compare that with quantization, we achieved almost 500 Hertz. So we get um, faster, faster computation or faster predictions. All right, so in summary for this, we designed that ESP32 CSI tool. Uh, we also did a survey of a lot of Wi-Fi sensing components and built out that taxonomy. And we also evaluated based on those components, things like the sampling rate, the inference rate, as well as energy usage. Yes. 
I have like one question on this. So, like, you know, the conversion of deep neural networks is a pretty big topic in machine learning. So, you know, quantization is one of the oldest techniques used in this field. So, how your methodology or this intake is like a standard quantization technique compares to more like a state of the art things? Absolutely. This is just using basic, okay. nothing special. Yep. This is just to understand, make sure that everyone understands that we can run these on these small devices. Yep. Um, okay, so assuming that we can run devices on or run machine learning on small devices or maybe even more powerful, uh, like single board computers or something, um, how could we achieve all three of these things? So, how can we achieve Wi Fi sensing, tiny machine learning, and then moving to learning on embedded devices? So, what we're looking at here is looking at if we have a sensor based system, well, that sensor we can constantly uh, receive more and more information from the sensor. So we get more and more readings continuously. So that's an, a data stream. So how do we train a model based on these data streams? Because there's two problems. When we look at the edge, we have very slow computation speed. So each sample that we get in, we cannot update the model in any intelligent way, not fast enough before the next, the next sample comes in. And we also have very low storage space. So we can't store all of the samples um, to, to perform training in batch later on. So instead, the solution is to store fewer but more important um, of those samples. And we store that into a buffer. And what we look at here is um, the way we model this is that we're given all time instances. Let's say we install a system and we collect data over lots of time instances. What we want to find is a buffer, which is a subset of since the installation until the current time, which allows us to achieve this buffered input data set and buffered output data set. And let's look at the illustration over here to understand more what's happening here. So we have a transmitter and receiver. The people are doing different activities in between. We've got the multipath uh, environments changing based on that. So when the receiver receives that channel state information samples, we then Go to step one, so we're collecting the data and we pass it down to a stream sampler, which is step number two. So the stream sampler then decides, okay, is this an important sample? We have to do this in real time. Um, is this uh, an important sample or is it not important and we can ignore it? So we can see in the illustration, the first two samples, those have an X. That means uh, that, means that the, sa the sample wasn't important enough. But the third one was important. So what that means is we have to store it somewhere in the buffer, replace one of the previous samples in the buffer. Um, and once we're done with this, we can take this buffer and then train our machine learning model. Do you have a question? How do you separate important and unimportant samples? Do you have like another model for it or? We're gonna talk about it on the next slide. Okay. Right. Oh, Yes. How many children do you lose? We'll talk about it on the next slide. It's both of them are kind of together. So the question is, how do we rank the importance of these, these things? So of course we're comparing, is it important? And is it more important than one that was already in the buffer? So of those sampling methods, we can look at a baseline, which is an extending window case. So assuming we have an unlimited buffer size, um, every single sample we get, we can store it in a buffer and the buffer just gets larger and larger as time goes on. This is not realistic, of course, but it shows the highest possible case we can achieve. Uh, we also have a rolling window. So assuming our buffer size is something like 100 samples, um, we only take the most recent 100 samples there. We could also look at random. So we just randomly decide, okay, this is important or not important. Um, and then based on that, we can randomly place it in the buffer. Uh, more interestingly, we can look at something like the most recent lowest loss. So assuming that those buffer, the buffer is sorted um, depending on the loss of the sample at a given time t, um, if the loss at time t is less than the, the highest one that already exists in the buffer, then we can, we can simply replace it and, and resort it. And the opposite of that is most recent highest loss. So here, yeah, it's just the opposite. So we just keep all of the highest loss functions as they come in in the data stream. 
And beyond that, we have this variable low high loss method. So we have two separate buffers, uh, the high loss buffer and the low loss buffer, and we combine those together. The sizes of them should be related to this ratio parameter, which is between zero and 100%. Yes. So let's <clears throat> follow on that. So maybe just two short comments. First of all, like sampling from streams is a very well established array. Yeah. Mining. So the some of those methods you name, there are other names that are actually used in the domain. So for example, we don't call it rolling wind, never heard of this. It's called sliding wind. And that small thing, but you know, it's very important when you present a piece of pieces to actually use a nomenclature that's used in the domain you're talking about, not come up with your own. That for the sake of you know uniformity. The second thing, what do you see at this point as the biggest drawback? Because obviously, like the rolling winds, the sliding window, random, terrible ideas. What do you see as the biggest problem with the what you call most recent loss and most recent highest loss, or even with the variable combination? Can you think about the biggest disadvantage of this? Yeah, the biggest disadvantage of this and just um, in general learning on the edge is that. We're assuming we can access a loss function, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So how do we actually get that? So we have some ideas of it, and they're not perfect. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hoping to do beyond all of this is to understand what can we do to accomplish this? How can we figure out, based on an input data, how can we get a loss? Or how can we get, what is the label for that activity? Absolutely. There's even one bigger problem. That okay. With you, but the bigger problem is that the loss doesn't, directly translate to the importance of the sample. Okay. There's a lot, a lot of work showing that the loss on a sample does mean it's going to enrich the actual training set. Especially that whenever you deal with the streams, you need to either account for what we call constant drift, so the fact that the priorities, you know, probabilities are soon going to shift over time, and you need to deal with the fact that you may be dealing with out of distribution samples. So then the loss actually going to be a counterindicator to how the sample has been used. So that's something that you should like, you know, have in mind. As for the how to do the loss, there is a lot of very interesting approximation functions. We have a way simplified loss function that we can use just by input. So that may be just something to it. But everything else is very interesting. So don't, please don't take it as a critique. Treat it more as like enhancing what you already said. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Already. Thank you. All right. So for our system, what we do is we we do this training over multiple rounds. So in round number one, um, what we'll do is we'll see uh, different activities. Thank you. Uh, we'll see different activities. Um, so we might see activity one, two, three, and four, and we run our buffer based on this. And what we'll do is store, yeah, we'll store all of our activities or whichever ones are most important into our sample. And then we have a training period. We follow that uh, with the next round where we then see some more samples and then we train and evaluate our system and so on and so forth. For our system, we had to collect data over 25 different rounds. Um, all right. So here, what we have is that one baseline measurement. So on the y-axis, we have the round number. So it goes from one all the way to 25. And each of these black pixels indicates which sample was stored in the buffer. So in the expanding case, every time we see new samples, it gets stored in the buffer. So each round, the buffer gets larger and larger and larger until it sees all of the samples that we collected. Um, the rolling case, we only took the most recent. So you can see that none of the samples are retained over multiple rounds because we see too many samples. Um, with the random case, we can see um, a similar sort of shape some of the samples are retained over multiple rounds, but they're not retained for very long. Now, if we then move to the most recent lowest loss and most recent highest loss, it kind of goes towards what he was discussing earlier. So if we only select the lowest loss or the highest loss samples, we end up getting stuck with a lot of samples, whether they're good or bad. Um, and they get, they get stuck in our buffer the entire time um, for, for many of them. So the way that we can kind of visualize this is based on the shape of this curve. So here we have two S curves. An S curve shows up due to many of the samples being retained compared to the more linear curves, the zero samples retained versus uh, very few samples retained over multiple rounds. 
So in the proposed variable low high loss method, we end up with something that's a bit more linear. We don't get stuck with so many samples, um, but we do end up with at least a few samples that do get retained over time. So we're not getting stuck with a bunch, but we're not losing all of this potentially important information. And we can see the effect of this um, here. The blue and red line, those indicate the most recent lowest loss and most recent highest loss. And we can see approximately at round five, they both reach a plateau. So they're not increasing in accuracy at all compared to the variable low high loss, which is not getting stuck with so many samples. Uh, the accuracy continues to increase um, even up to round 25. So we could potentially go even higher if we collected more data. All right, so in summary for this work, the goal was just to understand What's some ways that we could potentially train on this unlimited buffer of data on small devices? So how can we learn some amount of knowledge here? And towards that, we introduced the variable low high loss sampler, uh, which does reduce the amount of storage that we need um, and also increases the accuracy compared to the other sampling methods we discussed. All right, so assuming that we can then train and learn new knowledge at each of the devices independently, this leads us on to how can we take that knowledge and then share it with other, other devices? How can we collaboratively learn more information? So here we propose something called wide federated. And this is the goal that we're looking at here. So we're given a set of locations L. We've got L1, L2, L3, Ln in the illustration here. We want to minimize for all of the locations. We want to find a machine learning model that minimizes for all locations and for all data at each location, all the data that was available in that buffer, we want to minimize uh, some loss functions. We want to cross entropy loss here. Uh, the thing is, PK, which is the data at each client device K, we want to make sure that that remains private. I don't want to share all of my information with my peers, and I don't want to share all of my information with a central server or central entity uh, or company. So towards this, we select a subset of devices, uh, so L hat. Here in the illustration, it's L1 and L2. Uh, and we ask each of them to independently train locally uh, to personalize on their own data set that they have. So with that, we get theta one for location one, theta two for location two. We take those, we get those new weights, we share them to a central server, um, who then performs federated averaging, aggregate the weights together, and we end up with a new federated model, theta R plus one. And what we do is we take this new model and we send it back into the network uh, to each of the devices and we repeat over multiple rounds. So eventually um, they should be able to create generalizable knowledge that's shared across all devices. All right. So for this, we did have to collect some new data. Uh, so we collected Wi-Fi sensing data from 10 unique locations with four different activities, sitting, standing up, stand and sit down. Uh, and for each of these activities in each of the locations, we had to repeat the activities 50 different times, which means 2,000 repetitions of this, uh, where the first 25 is used just for training and the final 25 is used for evaluation. Now, it takes a lot of time to do this. It takes a lot of effort. And in fact, all of the works that I've done, that we've done uh, regarding Wi-Fi sensing, requires a lot of manual process for collecting new data. Um, so our goal is really to reduce how many we need for training. And that's what we're going for uh, here with the Y federated approach. So first, let's see what the effect of federated averaging is. Here we can see for three different locations, we train a model and the accuracy increases over each epoch until a certain point. Right here uh, at round 50, we perform federated averaging. So what's happening is each of the devices is learning some local amount of information. And if we keep training for too long, well, then we're going to move away from learning generalizable information and move into learning really specialized information, something that might only be applicable to the one device or the one location. So instead, maybe we want to train for a shorter amount of time so that all of the devices can then um, work together and understand where are the other Where's the gradient of the other devices? What direction is that going? Um, and when we change this number of epochs from 50 to different values here on the x-axis, we find that if we were to perform federated averaging after one epoch of training, well, we get the best accuracy. 
However, this ends up with a lot of network usage. So after each round, we have to then take the, the weight from each location, send it up to a server, and then the server has to send it back to all of the devices. And if that's hundreds of devices, uh, it can take a lot of time and a lot of uh, energy. So we want to find more of a balance of how many epochs we need there. Now, when we compare starting with a local model at the device versus starting with a federated model, we end up with something like this. Let's just focus on the one plot here. They're all kind of the same. Uh, so here we've got the blue lines. These are the federated models, the model that's started out uh, with a federated trained model. Uh, and we find that the accuracy starts out high and it stays high. Uh, but if we compare that to training locally on the, the data that's there from a randomly initialized model, we end up starting out with a very low uh, accuracy. We need a lot of epochs potentially and a lot of training time to then reach a higher accuracy. And we also need a lot of data, which might not be available to all of the devices. The goal, again, is we want to reduce, for each of the devices we deploy in the system, we want to reduce how much data we need to train them and get them ready for their new environment. All right, so then we then move on to a comparison of the state of the art. So we've got our wife federated. So this model, it's training in parallel. So each of those devices can train their model without having to yeah, performance sequence. Um, and it's also private, so we don't have to take that data out of the device. We can keep it at the device. Compare that to just the global training. Um, so in this case, we ask all the devices to take their raw data, send it up to the server for processing. So that's not privacy preserving. Um, the next one is transfer learning. So taking that global model, taking it to each device, and then asking it to post train to personalize a bit. Um, and then we have something called the EI framework, which is the environmental independent framework. It has three sub networks that need to be trained a feature extractor, an activity discriminator, and a location or environment discriminator. And we want to minimize the, the loss in predicting for the accuracy while maximizing the loss for predicting what environment it is. And the idea is that we can, um, we can get a model that's good at understanding activities, but is not going to be generalized to or specialized to any given location. So when we compare these different methods, we can see we have, we're going to have four lines. Uh, the main important one is uh, our proposed Y federated, the black line. What we end up with is a plot like this. And the x-axis is the number of training locations that we use. Um, so we go from two all the way up to seven. Um, and we can see that the accuracy increases as we increase the number of locations that are involved in training. That's because there's more knowledge that can be gained when we have more devices. I mean, see in each of these cases that the black line, the federated learning model, does achieve higher accuracy than the other state-of-the-art methods. But that's not really the most important thing. The more important thing is how much time it takes. Well, the more important thing is uh, how private is the learning method. But the next most learning thing, uh, most important thing is how much time does it take to train these models. So we end up with something like this. We can see in the federated approach, because um, the model can be trained in parallel across each device, no matter how many devices are selected, we end up with, as we increase the number of training locations, the increase in training time negligibly uh, increases. If you compare that to the global model and the transfer model, um, as we increase more devices, more time is required to train the model. And when we look at even the EI framework, uh, because the EI framework is essentially twice as large, um, it of course takes twice as long to train. In addition to this, we looked at how do we select clients? So how do we select which clients are going to help us potentially um, understand, or how are we going to select clients that are going to give us the most important information? So in this case, we have a set of maybe 100 locations, we selected a subset of those to train on. And then after they trained, we need to decide which ones are going to potentially um, increase the generalizability of our model versus decrease the generalizability of our model. And similar to the previous work, we looked at a, a random method, a loss highest and a loss lowest method. And uh, we found that the loss lowest method works the best. Uh, and that makes sense because uh, loss kind of equates to the error. So what we can say is um, if the model ends up with a low error, then that should mean that 
the knowledge that's being gained is similar to what was gained from previous devices in previous rounds of federated learning. All right, so in conclusion here, we contributed uh, for the first time we introduced federated learning for Wi-Fi sensing. So like I said, uh, previous systems were much more cumbersome. They're not as easy to deploy. If we can use small devices, it's really easy to deploy and collect new data. It's still very challenging, but it just makes it a little bit easier. And we collected a novel data set um, to handle this with 2,000 different data repetitions that we can use for training. And we identified that lowest loss client selection method. All right. So with what we've been talking about so far, we're trying to understand how we can run Wi-Fi sensing on a small device. So if we can achieve Wi-Fi sensing, this um, device-free sensing modality um, on a device that's easy to conceal like this, what does that mean? Can there be attacks? Could there be uh, surveillance attacks? Um, so that's what we're going to look at here. So in my opinion, I think Wi-Fi sensing can enable really important um, device-free sensing tasks, uh, specifically with health-related things. It's great to be able to track and make sure that people are uh, have healthy behaviors. So um, making sure that you can track maybe uh, if someone falls down, you want to be able to track that at all times uh, because you want to react to that and call emergency services or something. Uh, but of course, because the wireless signals are all freely available, an eavesdropper could easily perform adversarial surveillance against us. So we need to think of a balance of this. So first, we look at a really simple case of a way that an attacker could use this technology. So this idea here, this first one, is the through wall occupancy monitoring. So this has existed for a long time with any kind of radio frequency signal. So we have a line of sight scenario, we have a hallway environment, we have a transmitter and receiver, those are placed behind a wall, and we can track as a person moves um, in between those antennas. And like I said, this has existed before channel state information. So we'll use something like RSSI, this is the received signal strength indicator. And we can see there's two peaks in the signal, in the time series signal, that indicate, okay, uh, somebody passed by and then another person passed by. So the outcome is that what already exists, this RSSI is really easy to use for line of sight cases. But typically an adversarial is not gonna, an adversary is not going to have access to both sides. Uh, maybe one side is a public area and the other side's a private area for some sort of secure environment. Um, in which case we might have a non-line of sight scenario. The transmitter and receiver are placed against one wall, signals transmitted in and reflected back outside. So for example, here, anybody can access um, this wall right here outside of these windows. It's really thick walls, so maybe not the perfect analogy. Um, but someone could easily place some devices there, potentially sense in here. Uh, the problem is with that RSSI signal, if we look at the time series, we end up with just a bunch of noise. We can't detect when the person walks through. So RSSI is not a good solution for this non-line of sight case. Uh, but that's okay because we have channel state information. And if we perform pre-processing, we found that we could start by taking the amplitude and perform some windowed outlier filters to clear out any sort of a noise or anomalies that might show up in the signal. And for each of the subcarriers, we then perform a windowed noise metric. So we take um, the amount of noise that's found at each, um, each subcarrier over each time. We calculate that and we want to find how much do each of the subcarriers agree with the amount of noise. We find the intra subcarrier agreement. So, this is where we look at if one subcarrier sees a lot of noise, it could just be some sort of anomaly in the, um, in, in the data that we collected. Uh, but if a lot of the subcarriers agree, then that must mean that there's some activity that's happening that we can track in there. Um, so, if we look at this ACSI metric that we we created here. The line of sight case we can see does give us really good um, peaks. Here. So there were four passes through the environment in this case. And similar for non-line of sight cases, we also see similar case. We have four peaks here. So it's really easy using this channel state information compared to RSSI to track as the person, person passes by. So using these peaks, we can easily achieve human detection uh, human presence detection to identify when a target or no target is present. Um, so we can set up some sort of threshold, let's say. 
And if we set the threshold between 2.5 and 2.7 for our data set, we can see that we can get 100% true positives, 100% uh, true negatives. Um, kind of interesting, we can then move this on to human detection, uh, human direction detection. So we place the transmitter in the middle and a receiver on both sides. Uh, we end up with one set of, of devices makes a blue, blue reflection and the other one makes a red reflection. So some target moves from left to right, they end up passing the blue and then the red. And we can see in the signal, it's really obvious that this does work. Um, here we can see the person passes by red to blue, that means they go right to left, and then go blue, red, red, blue, blue, red, so they're going back and forth. Um, so this is a really, really, really high level, simple attack that could be achieved. It doesn't need, yeah, a really high level attack uh, to achieve line of sight, human detection, non-line of sight, human detection, and then um, human direction, identification, all through the wall. So that shows an attack. We want to then look at how we can defend against these sorts of things. So not only this sort of attack, but even more advanced attackers. So someone that's using, trying to detect what specific physical activities you're using. So going back to the machine learning approach. So if we can run machine learning on these small devices, um, yeah, if we can run machine learning on these devices, can, can we defend against these, these eavesdroppers? We propose something called an, an anti-eavesdropping system. So let me reiterate. Uh, there's actually two sets of devices that we care about. We have a set of allowed devices, and we have a set of disallowed devices. So the disallowed are the eavesdroppers. The allowed are the ones that are performing some sort of sensing like a fall detection or whatever application we want to bring in to our own homes. So to allow and disallow specific devices, we propose uh, a system that's designed like this. In the illustration, we have five antennas, TX A, B, C, D, and E, and these are spatially distributed within our environment. These specifically for our experiment are placed 70, 70 centimeters apart uh, along one wall. And we can see that we have a, a TX source device, D, and this is what's actually deciding what frames are sent at any time. So this can be installed uh, for any sort of Wi-Fi system. And that, that, that source is attached to an antenna switch, which then decides which of the antennas should transmit at any given time. And we select the antennas based on a scheduler module S that is like a function. We're given time T and we're returned which of those antennas is supposed to transmit. Now, because we're using a single source device, um, the MAC address is exactly the same no matter what antenna we're using. The sequence number of the actual frame, or the actual packets that are transmitted is indistinguishable. So nothing is special about this system that would make it look uh, obvious to, to anybody. Uh, it works just like any sort of Wi-Fi protocol. So like I mentioned, there's two different sets of devices. We have an allowed and we have a disallowed um, Wi-Fi sensing devices. So first we wanna model this allowed RX case. So in the allowed RX case, we'll have a three-dimensional tensor, something like this. Uh, we have, on the x-axis, we have time. So each time we collect some data, um, and each time we collect some amount of subcarrier frequency, amplitude, and phase. And we also have five transmitters. So what we can do is we can uh, take a slice of this tensor. We can ask for, uh, give me all of the CSI for all of the time instances uh, for antenna. I, we'll end up with a matrix like that, E times S. We can take a further slice where we select for antenna I, we wanna see what CSI did we get at time I. So we end up with a vector of subcarriers here. Now at each time instance, now at each time instance, we have five different antennas. And what we do is we apply a soft equals function where, where it equals one when A equals B, zero when A does not equal B, uh, given a sufficiently large value of beta. What that means is if, if we select by our scheduler uh, that I should be transmitting, then that one's going to uh, be multiplied by one. And if it's not selected, it's gonna be multiplied by zero. So we end up with something like this. So if the yellow antenna is selected, that those CSI samples are retained, 
and all of the other ones are set to zero. That's why they're gray here. Now, if we apply this over each time instance, we end up with something like this. So we have the same tensor structure as at the beginning, but now we have less information because only one transmitter is communicating at any given time. So we move on to the disallowed RX. So in this case, we start with that same scenario we have. We're gonna do a slightly different transformation. So because the disallowed RX does not necessarily know what transmitter, yeah, what transmitter antenna is transmitting, uh, we apply a summation across this dimension and we end up with something like this. So now we have just a, a matrix uh, because it's all sum, summed against this. Um, the disallowed does not know which antenna is transmitted, but we do each frame, each time instance is a different uh, antenna. Now, again, we have less information and we also have a new uh, smaller structure. So when we compare the allowed RX and the disallowed RX, the allowed RX has that three dimensional structure compared to the disallowed, which only has two dimensions. So that extra dimension is which antenna was communicating at each time. So the question is, since both of them have the same amount of equal CSI data, can we use this extra structural information to better train a machine learning model to understand what activities are happening compared to what would be achieved by an eavesdropper? We use something called a tree structured partisan estimator, where we want to try to find some different hyperparameters. Uh, and our hyperparameters here are the probabilities that each of the antennas is transmitted. So in our case, we found that transmitter A reveals a lot of information about whatever activities we're trying to detect. So we probably don't want to transmit too much with that device or with that uh, antenna because it's going to reveal a lot of information to the eavesdropper. So when we apply this, we end up with these plots here. Let's look at the first one. On the x-axis, we can see the probability for transmitter A antenna. As we increase that probability, the accuracy of the eavesdropper also increases. So again, we don't want to transmit too much from transmitter A. We want to reduce that. Compare that to TXB, we get a general downward trend in the accuracy for the eavesdropper. So we want TXB to be communicated uh, more often. Now, we don't want to any of them to be transmitting 100% of the time, because that's going to cause detriment to not only the eavesdropper, but also to the allowed sensors. It's really important that we use the diversity of the antennas to improve the allowed device. So using all of these results here, we end up with the table, just focus on the bottom one. We select a station probability for TXA, the TXA antenna of 6%, TXB at 26%, and so on and so forth. And for the eavesdropper, the accuracy ends up at 40.85%. Compare that to the allowed RX, uh, it achieves 88.19%. Um, so when we compare these two, um, for the allowed RX, we find that sensing is possible and it's also improved. So if we just had that TXA, if that was transmitting alone, we would have achieved 84.6% accuracy. Compared to with our method, when we're using the diversity of antennas, we end up with 88.2%. The disallowed, on the other hand, which could have achieved 84.6 if we just used TXA, only achieves 40.9% um, with our method. Now, one of the important things is this is uh, all about communication systems. This is something that's going to be leveraged uh, potentially in real world systems. Uh, communication packets do not look any different. They act exactly like normal, even though we're switching which antenna is transmitting. All right, so in conclusion, uh, the contributions that we discuss here, uh, the, the, the contributions we had discussed in this presentation are as follows. We designed a really thorough survey of a lot of Wi-Fi sensing papers to identify components and techniques uh, to develop a taxonomy for edge Wi-Fi sensing. We also developed a system that allows people to actually uh, use this on small devices, something that's really easy to deploy and, and perform experiments with. We proposed a stream sampling method to train a model. Uh, we showed that we could use the variable low high loss sampler to improve against the other methods. We also proposed a collaborative machine learning system, so the Y federated system, and looked at different client selection methods there. And we looked at a potential attack using ACSI to understand line of sight non-line-of-sight and uh, direction 
identification. And finally, uh, we looked at our proposed method to prevent eavesdroppers from, from performing Wi-Fi sensing while still allowing uh, good devices to perform Wi-Fi sensing. We did that through that multi-antenna scheduled system. So since the last, yeah, since the, my proposal back in 2022, we've had four papers that were accepted um, or published. Stars indicate what we kind of talked about today. We also have three that are three papers that are work in progress, as well as what we had, what I, we discussed previously in the, the proposal defense, um, these six Wi-Fi sensing papers and these three other papers about other topics that are kind of related. Uh, so that concludes my discussion. So if anybody has questions, please feel free to let me know. I have a question. Yes. So I'm confused about the line of sight thing from the point of view of kind of applications. If I have line of sight, wouldn't I want to use a camera? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, would this be then more applicable towards situations where I already have Wi-Fi in this room, for example? So I might as well use it to do some additional sensing because it's already available. Exactly. So there's that. These devices are everywhere, right? Um, but there's also, I, I don't really want a camera watching me at all times. So the Wi-Fi is not going to give us as much information as a camera. It's going to be a little um, more privacy preserving compared to a camera-based system. So if you don't want the camera, that's also a good reason. Okay, my final question. So do you, do you assume that the transmitter and the receiver are static? Can they be moving? And if they are moving, then, you know, I think, I, I, I mean, that might be more difficult, right? Because of Doppler effect, things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So we looked at, right at the beginning, we looked at just one experiment where we moved the devices. Um, yeah, absolutely. It just adds more things. But it's kind of, it's so going. It's possible to do it that way? I mean, I know? haven't done, very, I've only done a single experiment um, with this sort of idea. But I think it's a really interesting thing to do. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Stella. Uh, could you please bring up slide 69? This one. So, yeah. <laughs> so, on the left, you, hear you, ask, you said that you changed some of the data to zero. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible to add noise to the other data? Or, I mean, is it a good idea or not? Okay. So the idea is that the noise can help. Uh, what are you thinking? So how do, would noise uh, improve? I mean, I'm saying that because I don't want to lose the information. You know? So maybe that's a good idea instead of making them zero, just change them a little bit based on a specific algorithm. Okay. So the idea here is we're trying to make a really simple system. So mm -hmm. can we only communicate over one antenna at a time? So if we're changing the actual protocol and sending noise over different antennas, that's actually changing the, the lower level. Um, it's, it's doing things that are not standard to 802.11. Um, so what that means is if you have another device that needs to communicate to this, um, it's going to have some trouble if you're sending out a lot of noise. It's going to cause jamming effects um, because you can't reverse it on a standard smartphone or something. Yes. Uh, I have a question regarding, so your results based on this paper is for a certain position of receiver and a certain position of this eavesdropper. Yeah, absolutely. And what is the relative distance between them? Are they in the same point? Um, so no, they're placed, uh, so the receiver is placed behind a wall. So again, like that adversary idea. So we, we have one here. It's not in the room. So the adversary can have access to that room without having to actually be able to put devices inside your potentially one. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you for the presentation. It's a lot of words that I will touch on that. And I have a question about the eavesdropper. Uh, so what I've uh, understood uh, from the presentation that we're trying to confuse the eavesdropper with uh, some redundant antennas, right? So, uh, uh, what if uh, the observer know, knows uh, which antenna is uh, 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 transmitting at a certain point? Uh, uh, what may be the line of defense after that, in your opinion? Yeah, so one of the ways that someone could recognize where the location is, is by localizing the antenna. And if you can localize the antenna, then 
you can you can figure all of this out and find some other ways. So our goal is to obfuscate what is physically happening in the environment. But there's other people that are obfuscating the location of antennas. So hopefully that can be a defense mechanism. So this is a, a completely different question or a different research topic um, that would be really interesting to 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 look into. Does that help answer the question? Or? I think you uh, talk about the scheduler that uh, used. Uh, could you elaborate on that? So the scheduler here is very simple. So it's using random probabilities for each of the transmitting antennas, and we set those probabilities based on that tree partisan estimator. So we tried lots of different parameters to see what's going to be best. Now there's more work that can be done related to doing this online and in, in other systems, but this is this is definitely future work. Thanks. Yes. Um, when you're talking about uh, pulling information and storing it in a buffer, mm -hmm. trying to minimize the size of your buffer, um, did you find uh, a minimum amount of information that's required before your predictions start breaking down? So, uh, no, I didn't try that. That's a good question. So we started with a small number, some 100 samples, and then we moved forward. We, we tried even larger amounts. Um, no, that, that's a good question to, to try. Okay, so you mentioned this for like physical therapy app, like applications like recovery and straight over. Because I want to pick, piggyback off the I don't want a camera in my space watching me at all times because that's a huge uh, issue for device adoption. So let's say we've got a patient, they're at home space. Have you considered like or just found anything neat about what happens when you're adapting these to, for example, just non-perfectly square rooms or anything you can see, just having interesting effects on how your different antennas are deployed in the environment? Okay, so your question is about um, when you move to more realistic cases, what sort of problems might show up? Is that kind of? Yeah, or just anything you might have found uh, in your reading or anything you might have just while you were researching thought, oh, this looks kind of cool. So what was mentioned earlier was like the data drifts. Um, so that's a really big challenge here. So we, like I said, all of these experiments, we had to collect brand new data. So it's really challenging to collect new data over a whole week or a whole month or an entire year. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. And then you have to find out how do you label this information to actually understand what's happening. So there's some interesting works, um, a few looking at the data drift uh, for longer time periods. Um, but we haven't we haven't done anything that's uh, that large scale. Cool, thank you. Thanks. Yes. So, uh, in, in your entire presentation, you've been talking about uh, one target in, in a room. Um, I don't see how this would scale to say several people. Um, can you speak on to that? Are there any like theoretical or critical limitations that would? prevent you from scaling to several people, or is that like a completely different research topic? I think typically when we start looking at that, we bring in more antennas. And because the multipath is affected by uh, each of the people in there, certain antennas are gonna be more affected by certain people than the others. And we can kind of combine that information in some way to, to, to track those sorts of things. But yes, it does cause extra issues. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't see your hand. Uh, so what is the like, sort of like range or scale that you can achieve with this sort of sense? So if you if I click a sensor right here, could I detect someone over there, like falling on us? So the main difference between this and a normal sensor or even typical radar systems is that you do have two devices, a transmitter and a receiver. If you place them really close, you're not going to get very much information. So um, if we place one sensor here and we place another sensor somewhere over there, then sure, we can track certain things here. Um, what if we place them on like both on one side, like the adversarial case? Say that again? What if we like place both our X and TX on the same side, like in the adversarial case that you showed? How far would the range? Um, so the range that we had was um, maybe four meters at most. Um, so we didn't try anything beyond that, but... Uh, 
it, it does cause a lot of issues. You end up with a lot more noise, as especially when it propagates through the walls, because the walls um, might not be completely solid. They might have extra causes of reflection. Is that so what if the adversarial targets itself the probability? It knows that you have several attempts. You have the candidate. So you came up that the optimal probability is 24 first, 84. Yes. If it has a okay, if it knows that you're using this type, what you're using, okay, it has access to the information that if you have five antennas and a certain probability for each antenna to transmit something. Sensing the information. Okay, I don't want to kind of sense the position of the person. Is it possible for me using another machine learning to sense the to determine the probability itself for which antenna you will send it? To determine the probability. Yeah, because if I know the probability, probably already like since it, you don't change probability often time, so you set up it's a static probability, and if I can determine it, kind of I will achieve the same performance as your device now. Okay, so it's it's going in the reverse part. So we inc we have the probabilities we transmit out over the signals, and you're saying now we have the probabilities at the other device. We try to reverse which one is most likely to transmit. Um, there might be some interesting things we could do there, but again, it's um, just because you know that one antenna is transmitting five percent of the time, that doesn't help you necessarily encode it in any any more intelligent way. Um, there's, whenever you try to have attack and defense mechanisms, it's always a cat and mouse game. So there's always something that we can do um, to try to prevent this. And that's one way that we could look at. It. And then we could try to find a way to defend against that and back and forth. Um, Just how, how you would adjust the probability over time. So not to have a static probability. Do you have any ideas how to make it dynamic probability over time? So you it will be more efficient. Yeah, this goes back to how do we learn on data streams, uh, which is kind of, we need to understand something more about the information without requiring people to manually annotate information. So it's more about as we get more information, then we can continue learning this sort of thing. So then federated learning setup, it implies that you'll have four rooms with four people doing at the same time different actions. Not at the same time. So this could be located anywhere. It's just easier that we put them all in one um, one environment for our case. And no, it just federated setup learning. So if I have a room that you kind of sensing and you don't have, so your generalization is for the room itself. Because if a person, like if in one room, the person just sitting because it's an office and another type of room, how, the actions that the person takes into a room affects a federated learning algorithm. Because, for example, in one room, people just sitting all the time and you're kind of catching both, well, only sitting in this room and only standing in our room. How you combine it, how it affects the final one if you do a federated approach. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's uh, extra steps. To, uh, there's a lot of people that are focusing exclusively on learning. So, um, this, I mean, this just goes to the general questions in machine learning of class imbalance, right? That's, that's one step of it. And then there's also, how do we, so right now we're determining the importance of locations based on some metric, but that's another thing that we can input into our model. So um, does the model have enough information to actually give storage? So it's, this, there's a whole field about this. So I don't have anything to, to add to that at this moment. And why prediction rate is so important? Since we are trying to sense, and like you said, the 50% is around 10 times per second, like why you want to achieve something more. <laughs> if then, if we, are, if we are saying that to say what person is doing in the room, 10 seconds, like determine, have a prediction 10 times per second is more than enough. Okay, so the main thing that I was trying to show there is that the, the designs that exist so far, they get 10, 10 predictions per second or less. But again, they're using really powerful hardware to make these predictions. So they can take all of that data, store it in the GPU, and then process each one in continuous. 
But if we move those same exact models into these small devices, um, it's going to reduce the, the rate way down. So that's one of the parts. And another thing is the energy usage, like I was saying. So let's say it takes you one millisecond to compute uh, a prediction. If you only need 10 Hertz, well now you only have to spend 10 milliseconds on, on a prediction making computations for a whole second. The rest of that time can be leveraged for other tasks or more, more usefully put into sleep mode so we don't have to spend so much energy. So batteries are really important in our, our case. Okay, thanks. You can ask another one. Ah. I realized I'm supposed to be handing this out to people. Do you have anything in the chat? Yeah, there's just one question. Can you just point to this? <clears throat> All right. For the federated model scenario, was there a long delay period for the devices to receive the models from the server? So right now we're doing this all um, as simulation. So we're not actually uh, sending this off to the server. It really depends on the model size. Um, again, we're trying to use really small devices, whether these uh, ed embedded devices or single board computers. So the size should be relatively small. Really, the more important thing is these devices can be mobile. So they might not be attached or they might not be able to get network communication. Um, so if they're not able to get com network communication, they can't get this new information. They can't get the new, it might take longer before they can actually get that new model. So that's kind of more the important thing. Not so much how long it takes over network, it's can they even access it? But, oops. We'll get the question for the comments later. Yes. So for your model quantization. Sorry. Um, for your model quantization. I hope it's on. That's okay. They, they can use it on those. Gotcha. So for your model quantization approach, have you explored the trade-off between loss of the precision and how far you shrink down the model? No. So the problem with changing precisions, um, so if you use an odd number, so like one or three bits, um, it's not something that's typically handled by a lot of hardware. So there's people that are looking at how do you handle one bit operations for all of these, um, but it, it's just a theoretical sort of thing. So I'm really caring more so about what can we achieve on these devices? And we're kind of limited um, to actually evaluate, but it's a good question. I wanted to see if you're losing information for the downstream task, and then how much is it like state inputs? Because there is a loss of precision when it comes to scaling down the model itself. The data is not, it's not as precise as the complete model. So I wanted to yeah. see how, how it affects your downstream task. Yeah, I, absolutely. So I did do the quantization versus non quantization. I don't have the, the results right here. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? At least we got one. On the microphone. Is that right? Okay. So we need you to complete the moment. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming by, everyone.